Okay. Now, <clears throat> in the text, we're at the beginning of 17.5. The title here is Simple Circuits. Now, I don't know how much detail y'all will need in what you're doing. I think just a basic understanding of what's going on in circuitry. I'm not even sure why you would need that, except maybe y'all have to set up some circuits sometime. I don't, I don't know. So that's where we're beginning today is simple circuits. Now this slide is a little beyond where we're starting, so we'll come back to that. Uh, and look up here. This sort of turns the slide off of here. Okay. Is that in the way of anybody? Okay. Alright. Any questions on anything we've done up till now? Okay. Now, 17.4 was electric fields. Um, and 17.5 are simple circuits, and that probably sounds like they have nothing to do with each other, but in reality, they really have everything to do with each other. But you may not see that right off the bat, so let's talk about it a little bit. There's two types of circuitry we have. Anyone know what kind they are? Two types of current? Second? Okay, uh, circuits... Uh, there are those terminologies there. Let's talk more about currents. We have what we call direct current as opposed to alternating currents. Now what's the difference in those? What do we mean by direct current? Okay, the charges move typically only in one direction. Okay? I kind of threw a few weasel words in there because if you really were going to follow a charge, it goes like this. I don't know if you count that one direction or not. It's bouncing all over the place. It's really the field is only set up in one direction. Okay? So actually what we did last time is much closer to this than what we are. We do say the charges move in one direction because the Potential is in one direction. The, the potential difference is in one direction. And overall, the charges move. Whereas an alternating current, the charges hardly move at all, except very rapidly going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And that's all they do, okay? But again, the field expands. The field is what does the work, okay? So those are the two basic types of currents we have, direct and alternating. Where are, what are examples of each? Any of them know? How about the light from the projector here? What is that fueled by? Direct current or alternating current? Say again? It's alternating, okay? Because it's basically, you can't see where it's plugged in, it's just plugged into the wall, basically, okay? How about my computer here? Direct or alternating? Very good. It's plugged into the wall too, but notice what this is. This is a converter that converts alternating current coming in to the direct current going out. Just about all your electronic devices are direct current, DC. Let me put it this way. If it has a battery associated with it, it's generally direct current. Batteries only produce direct current. Now you can put circuit elements in there to make them alternate, but generally they only produce DC. So how about your laptop or your pad there? What would that be? Direct current. Direct current, absolutely. Because its charger has a big box on it, you know, uh, and some of them aren't as big as all, it, certainly not as big as that. Uh, your cell phone there. Wait, is that a cell phone or a calculator? Uh, this is Okay, that's a cell phone, and the other's a calculator. Yeah. What, what kind of current do they use? Direct. Direct, absolutely. Why? Because they do have batteries, but they also, when you plug them into the wall, 
you have some type of a converter there that makes it direct. How about your car? Direct or alternating? Direct. Direct, because it has a battery, right? Okay, but just by all your household uses, like your stoves, your clothes dryer, your washing machine, your television, you know, just about everything like that. I may back off television a little bit. I don't know. The newer TVs may be converted to direct. I don't know. Uh, but just about everything is alternating current, it seems, okay? Uh, but if it uses batteries. So a flashlight? Direct, okay. How about a drill? Okay, depends on what kind of drill. If it's one that you plug into the wall, and we have some of those. I have one that my sister-in-law's dad had, and no one wanted it, so I got it. And uh, it's one you actually plug in. It's an alternating current. But the ones, the most recent ones that I bought for myself has one of these batteries that you attach, so it's got to be a direct current. You charge the battery with uh, alternating current, but it converts it to direct. So it's hard to tell sometimes, okay? But those are the types of circuits. Now, what a circuit is, and it's composed of, is some type of a loop, okay? And this picture does as well as any. There's one in the book that's a little bit simpler, but this is just about as good as any. This shows a battery here, okay? Now, I'll do it the way that it says here. Let me back off a little bit. Remember when we talked about potential energy? When does this book have more energy? When it's down here or when it's up here? Up here, right, because if I dropped it on my foot, I would say, that's a lot worse than this, you know, because you raised it to a higher potential, okay? We haven't talked much about heat and temperature, but where does heat flow? From cold to hot or hot to cold? All, hot to cold, always, okay? Even though I can remember my dad saying, close the door, you're letting the cold in. Mm -hmm. No, you're letting the heat out. It's sort of some of both, but, but it always flows from hot to cold. Everything goes from high potential to low potential. Uh, concentration gradient always goes from a high side to a low side. If you have a high concentration of ions here, a low concentration there, through a semi-permeable membrane, they're going to go that direction. Okay? Always happens. Okay, it happens in the cells of your body. It happens everywhere. Okay, that's uh, things go down a gradient. Therefore, we have a problem when it comes to electricity. Okay, your chemical reaction that goes on inside a battery, and that's what's happening inside every battery, is a chemical reaction. Uh, we talked about batteries before, didn't we, last time? We didn't at all. Alexander Volta? Yeah, okay, a little bit there. Okay. I was going to ask a question, I think, last time. I don't think I ever got around to it. Have you ever had a battery in your mouth? Now, I ask this question sometimes when I'm teaching automotive mechanics. Of course, they've always stuck batteries in their mouth. That's not what I meant, okay? But have you ever had a battery in your mouth? Most of you probably say no, right? Okay. Now, maybe not... Uh, Everybody, but must, okay, Chris, if you really know what to oh, good for you, okay. <laughs> All right, now, any of you have a filling in a tooth? You have, okay. Have any of you accidentally bitten down on a piece of aluminum foil? Did you notice anything? Oh, you haven't, okay. That's interesting. Try it sometime. <laughs> yes. 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 Exactly. And what happened? It's a weird. Yeah, because I just eat oil. That's right. You're right. <laughs> Munch on it. Yeah. It's kind of weird. Like totally weird. What you had was a battery in your mouth, because the silver composite filling, which I'm guessing is what it is, is predominantly one metal. 
whereas the aluminum foil was a different metal, two metals with a electrolyte in between, your saliva is a great electrolyte, you just had a battery in your mouth. And it felt really bizarre because that filling goes real close to your nerve. And you just set a little electric pulse and it went ying and you went what, you know. Okay, now I ask again, have any of you ever have a battery in your mouth? I know you have. None of the rest of you ever bit down on aluminum foil or something else like that. Okay, try it sometime. I mean, it, it doesn't hurt badly, but you'll definitely notice you sent a, a, a charge. Well, that's what's going on in every battery is chemical charges, chemical reactions are moving charges one way and another way. And actually, inside the battery, you have the movement of ions. Positive ions move one way, negative ions move another way. Inside the battery, that's happening. Okay. Now, what they have shown here is pretty close to true when you talk about electrons. This is a direct current, because this is a battery. And unlike normal conventions, they're saying the plus side is the low energy side and minus is the high energy side. Now that flies in the face of every other potential we know about. The reason is the charge carriers here are typically electrons. Okay? And electrons are what charge? Negative. Negative. So that's why they seem backward. You're giving, you're increasing the energy of electrons when you send them toward to push them toward the negative pole and decreasing the energy on the positive side. Well, actually what's happening here, you have ions moving each direction, positive ions moving this way, negative ions moving this way. So electrons pick up the energy, high energy electrons, but it's negative charge, okay? So that's why it's kind of backwards. Now, <clears throat> in a lot of conventional text, not this text, obviously, but they will talk about two types of uh, flow. They sometimes will call this electron flow, which is indeed what this book is calling it. But if you do here, they'll say conventional current. And that would be in this direction where a positive charge would move if it were moving, okay? Typically, char positive charges don't move much. Ions move in the battery, but not outside. It's usually electrons. So a lot of times they'll show conventional current going one way and the electron current going the other. This book only shows the electron flow, and that goes from high energy electrons, which are at the negative pole, and low energy electrons at the positive pole, okay? And then you have the load over here. This happens to be a light bulb. Picture this as a battery, uh, a, a, a flashlight or something. You have the battery in here and the bulb here, something connecting the two. And this is DC because it is a battery, direct current, and it goes through like this. Now notice here too, if you ever notice a bulb, when you take it out, it's usually metal on the edges here where it screws in, right? And then there's almost always a little black circle at the bottom with another metal in the middle of it. That's necessary because the black is usually a plastic or something that's a non-conductor, okay, an insulator. And the charge comes in this side, goes through across the filament, and then out the other side and comes out, okay? So that's typically how your batteries work. I mean, your light bulbs work. Can you screw them in backwards or put the wires backwards? You, you certainly could. It doesn't matter to the light bulb which direction the electrons are flowing. They just need to flow. Okay? So this is energized electrons flow from the source uh, to the load and energy where the energy is lost. So here's what we're talking about. In the battery, you're boosting the energy of the charges, and the load, you're using that energy, producing light, producing sound, producing heat, producing whatever. 
your, your uh, load is. So, three things that you need for a circuit to be a circuit. An energy source, typically the battery or a generator. A load that's going to use that energy, expend the energy. And then you need a pathway. These are typically your wires, okay? They don't have to be wires, but most commonly they are, okay? So those are the three, I went down to get my book, but I left it up here. Three um, circuit elements you typically would have. All right, so what's the source of the energy? The battery, the potential difference, okay? Now let's talk about that potential difference. Did we talk about before, see, I'm teaching electricity in my physical science class too, and I'm getting crossed up in my head which one I've talked about. Okay, here's Kima. I saw you walking out there, so I knew you were on the way. Now, um, let me, before I forget about it, give you the test from the last chapter. I knew that's why you came tonight, so we're looking forward to that. And let me just ask you to make sure you did get the one from the previous chapter, right? Yeah. Everybody else got the one from the previous chapter? Okay. That was the one I had run off, left it. On the other campus, you asked me to put it on Blackboard. I put it on Blackboard, but then not everybody got it off Blackboard. So I've got plenty of copies of that. Okay, so the source of the energy is the battery or the generator if that's what you're, you're doing. That, in a battery, it's the chemical changes that are happening that pumps the, you can think of a battery as an energy pump, okay? Now, my question before was, did we talk about what this potential difference is? What it's measured in? We didn't talk about those units? No. What, does anyone know what potential difference is measured in? If you were going to measure the battery strength here, what kind of meter would you use? The voltmeter. The potential difference is measured in volts. Remember we talked about Alessandro Volta? He developed and, and experimented with the earliest of the batteries, and they named the unit for potential difference after him, volts. So it's a capital Z. Okay? There's another little strange thing there, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and that's the potential difference. So what is a volt? What is that measuring? Energy per charge. Energy is measured. Anyone remember what we measure energy in? I don't have one on here, but y'all might. Joule per, and what charge? Did we talk about that unit? Coulomb. Energy per coulomb. The unit, the SI unit for charge is coulomb. That's a capital C there because it's named after Charles Coulomb, a French physicist who did a lot of the early work with uh, electricity. In fact, the French did a lot of it. Louis Amp Ampere, the amp that's uh, current, is named after him. Uh, coulomb. And guess who one of our early ambassadors to France was? Well-known American statesman. Was one of our, I think that would be the first postmaster general. He, before he became in the politics type thing, he had started a business that was Poor Richard's Almanac. He uh, developed a stove, a sort of a pot belly stove has a name, but if I gave it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. He went out flying kites in the thunderstorm. Not Thomas Edison, he came later. Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin was a great statesman. He was actually one of the five writers of the Declaration of Independence. I'm pretty sure he was also on the committee that wrote the Constitution. He was honcho as a Diplomat, statesman, I'd say I'm a, not as politician, a statesman, but he was a fantastic scientist as well. Those combinations you don't usually find, okay? He was. 
He studied electricity and the thunderstorm. He was wise enough to have a key that took the current away from him and grounded it before it got to him. Uh, pretty sharp guy. He was an ambassador to France. You can't convince me that he didn't get together with Coulomb and Ampere, any of them that were alive and active at the time. And I bet you they talked shop until the wee hours of the morning. Okay. So this is what we need. So the voltage, the energy comes from the battery, okay? Because that's an energy pump. It gives energy to each charge. The charges are what move around, okay? So energy per unit charge, that's a volt, okay? And what you need is a pathway of a conductor and a load somewhere along the way. You may have more than one load there. Okay. I wish they had the picture of the battery, cutaway battery. It's in your text, but I wish they had that on the slide set. They don't. What most of your, what they call dry cell batteries are, typically the zinc can, the, the can they're in is actually the outer electrode, that zinc, and inside that is a carbon rod. Now, carbon isn't a normal metal, but it is a good conductor, and it has a uh, low electronegativity, whereas zinc has a high electronegativity. And in between, you have moistened, but not wet, paper or something else that acts as the separator between the two, and the positive charges move toward the carbon, negative charges to the zinc, the base of the battery is the negative side. The top of the battery, that thing at the top, the little cap on top, that's the end of the carbon. Okay. Now, what they're saying here, now in my book, and I don't know why this is the case. I think someone, Kima maybe was talking about it at the class last time. It looks like to me, even though this says Applied Physics 11th Edition, uh, and that's the book we have. Kima convinced me because she said her older book has these colors, right? You have green for that. Uh, yeah, so that looks perfect. And mine is red. So in the 11th edition, it's red. Even though this says 11th edition, they're still using the 10th edition uh, slides, okay? Uh, the bulb has... Uh, Gold coming out from that, this one has green. I mean, it's just really bizarre that they would do this. Okay, but they say, and this is a pretty good analogy. If you had a water pump, and, and, and cities do this, they, they have the water supply, they have a pump here, they pump it up into the water tower. The one down in uh, Clanton looks like a peach, you know that one? Okay. Uh, but a water tower, sometimes they're big, whatever the shape they are. But they pump the water up there, and then the reason they do this is everybody who lives down here has a lot, basically the same water pressure. You don't have to keep the pumps running, you just have to pump it up there and keep the uh, water in the tank. Okay? So, what would be analogous between your electrical system here and your water pump system there? Where do you get the energy here? The pump. That's what gives energy to the water. It moves it from a low potential here to a high gravitational potential here, just like the book. When I raise the book up, I'm giving more energy to the book. So the pump is analogous to the battery. It's moving the water up. Now this is not one supplying the city with water. This is taking and pulling water off and turning a turbine here, which may do work. What kind of work, I'm not sure, but it's turning a turbine, okay? So what's the turbine analogous to? The light bulb. The energy that the, the pump is giving the water to bring it up here, that energy is changing to kinetic energy of turning the turbine. We talked about that too last, you know, in earlier chapters, kinetic energy versus potential. And what would the pipes be analogous to? The 
the wires, the charge carriers, the, um, I usually call it something, I can't think of the name now, pathway, the pathway, okay? Um, this is giving, and then what would the water be analogous to? The water over here, what is being given energy here, using the energy there, being passed through the wires? The charge, yeah, the electrons are the charge carrier, the charge, okay? So yeah, that's your analogy here. Now here is where the analogy breaks down. What happens if you rupture the pipe? Water spews all over everything, right? What happens if you break the wire? Charges don't come spilling out, they stop. Okay? So, a little bit of a breakdown, but overall, a great analogy between a electrical system and a hydraulic system. Very, very similar analogy. Okay. All right. And what the battery does is give a potential difference in the charge, energy to the charges. What the water, the pump does is increase the potential energy of the water that later is con converted to kinetic energy, which in the light bulb, that's converted to light. Okay. And the charges are what carry the energy, energy joules per coulomb, and the water is what carries the energy uh, in the other. So let's move on to the conductor. Let's see if we have no... Okay. I do not see this figure. Oh, wait. <laughs> wow. That's 17.7. Okay. No more figures now for a bit. So I guess I will draw them. Um, and this isn't very accurate either, but it is, they're making their point here. Let's look at the conductors, which were the, the wires, the charge carriers. Okay? Now, let's time out here a moment. Here is just some kind of like nomenclature, but it's picture culture. I mean, it's what they use for illustrations. When you're talking about a battery, you usually draw parallel bars, but one long and one short. The long one's on the plus side, the short one's on the minus side. Now, in the previous one, they showed the electrons moving from negative to positive, which is in reality what's happening. But, by the conventional thing, we always draw the current, which is the movement of charge, is going in this direction, assuming the current would be a positive charge if the positive charge is moving. So the current, and the current symbol is I. Why? I don't know. But it's always been capital I. Okay? This is your battery. This is your load. Quite often they'll make that look like a light bulb, kind of. Another thing that they will do quite frequently is just make it a resistor, and typically that would be done like this. That represents a resistor, which is a load. If they put a circle around it, that usually makes it a light bulb. And it almost looks like a filament in a light bulb, so if, a, you, know, if you had that. But a resistor, that's typically. Switch, you don't have to have them, but they drew one in here. And then your pathway, of course, is the lines. Okay. But that's further on. That's not what we're dealing with now, but just since that came up. Um, I keep forgetting where I left my book. Let's first talk about the conductors. Okay? And what I was going to do was hold this up because not everybody has a book. And it probably would be better than me trying to draw it. Okay? And it's just this was a whiteboard and I wouldn't be hitting the screen. I was uh, worried about knocking the stuff off the screen. The conductor, and this isn't fair, but it, it's okay. 
A good conductor is showing the charge is moving along pretty easily without much um, interference. A poor conductor shows the carriers they're also moving along, but they're having a lot of bumps along the way. Okay? And that's okay, except that even in a good conductor, it looks more like this, and the poor conductor just looks more chaotic. Okay, because never in a good conductor, unless you have a superconductor, do the charges just move all that freely. They're always hitting other things and having resistance. In any line, you have some resistance. Okay, now, there are other things I wish... Okay, remember... When I was talking to that little black plastic here, I called it an insulator. It doesn't conduct electricity at all. It's between that bit at the end and the metal casing that's around here. Always, usually black plastic or something like that. Now, when you screw that into an outlet, into a you know, thing, a lot of times those are ceramic. Bad conductors, good insulators, okay? You don't want them conducting electricity away. You want it to only go in the path you want it to. So we have conductors, good conductors, poor conductors, whatever. We have insulators, which are terrible conductors, hardly conduct at all. And then there's a small number of materials that have only come into acknowledgement, really, in the last century or two. And those are called semiconductors. Now, where do you hear semiconductors referred to? The electronic industry. Uh, one time, if it was a semiconductor, it's not much good. It doesn't conduct too well and only in certain things. But they found out that building, using those semiconductors, I mean, this is what Silicon Valley is all about. Silicon dioxide, or silicon in general, sorry, I want to make sure y'all were awake. Okay. That is the home of our electronics industry. That's where Apple, that's where uh, many of the industries uh, got going. Uh, Intel, you know, all those things are, are out there. I see. Seattle claims to be pretty big on that, too. They have Microsoft and uh, is Amazon there? Where was that? Anyway. Uh, but semiconductors are fall in between conductors and insulators the ability to conduct electric current. Their importance is due to the fact that these materials, under certain conditions, allow current to flow in one direction only, not back up in the other. So silicon is a semiconductor used in transistors, integrated circuitry. Uh, they're neither good conductors nor good insulators in their pure, pure form. However, they become excellent conductors or insulators when an impurity is added and transistor, transistors are made by layering the semiconductor materials together. Selenium is one. So, so. Now, I mentioned another kind, and this is a superconductor. That would be what this should be. <laughs> that is a superconductor. Okay, they didn't illustrate it that way, they just had a good conductor. A superconductor has basically no resistance to flow at all. Two characteristics of, of, uh, of uh, superconductors. One, I don't know of any material that's a superconductor that's not at incredibly low temperature. I mean, really, really low temperatures. In the neighborhood of 35 Kelvin, maybe they have some up as high as 50 Kelvin, whereas the freezing point of water is 273 Kelvin. Okay, so that's the freezing point of water. These are way down there, much closer to absolute zero than the freezing point of water. Um, here's the other thing that's weird about them. 
Most of the time, your good conductors at normal temperatures don't necessarily make semi, uh, superconductors at very cold temperatures. It's usually some sorts of weird things that aren't very good conductors at normal temperatures suddenly become superconductors at low temperatures. Okay, they mentioned here uh, Heike Kamerling Anis. Okay, discovered superconductivity in 1911, shortly after he discovered how to liquefy helium gas. It goes hand in hand because he wouldn't have been able to discover superconductors unless he had something as cold as liquid helium. Now, helium is a very light gas, and to get it to go to a liquid, you have to drop the temperature incredibly low, very close to absolute zero, and then you discover superconductors. Uh, I think it says just below 4.2 K. Really, really, really cold. Like I say, uh, he probably got a Nobel Prize in physics for that. I don't know that for sure, but I think there's probably a disproportionate number of Nobel Prizes have gone to people who have developed superconductors. Because every time they find one that would be at a higher temperature, like liquid nitrogen rather than liquid helium, you know, they'll win a Nobel for that as well. All right, so that's the conductor. Most of the time we just use good conductors. Electronics, they use semiconductors. Oh, well, let me give you an example of a superconductor that's actually in use. Because the current moves, and actually, this is hard to believe, but once you get the current moving, you can take away the voltage, the voltage supply, because it doesn't stop moving. It just keeps moving. It's a superconductor. There's no resistance there. So, um, and any time there's a moving charge, we'll talk about this a little bit later, you produce a magnetic field. So a superconductor typically will produce a very strong magnetic field. And the Japanese came on this idea of let's really chill down our devices for their super fast trains, the track that they run on, and run a superconductor as your charge source there and then you've got a good magnetic field so the train actually is repelled by the track so it never touches and that's why they can go so fast there's no frictional losses if you can remove friction they can fly and those trains do fly they go much faster than any train we have uh, because they use that technology okay so we talked about the conductor. We're, we're looking at the pieces in the puzzle here. The, we talked about the battery, how it bumps up the energy of the charges. The charge carrier is the wiring or the uh, things that carries the charge. Uh, the conductors, or semiconductors or superconductors. Now let's move to the load. Now it's a very short paragraph here. The load in a circuit converts the electrical energy into something else, into light, into heat, into motion, into whatever. That's your, your load. Okay? Uh, now, what is the load using? Is it using up the charges that you energized? No charge cannot be created nor destroyed. The same charge that leaves the battery those high energy electrons, those come back. You don't lose the charge. It's not using up charge. What is it using? The energy the battery gave the charges. So that's expending energy. That's why you produce light, you produce heat, you produce motion, you produce whatever you're producing. That's what the load does. You don't use up the charge or the electrons or anything else. You use the energy that the battery is getting it. You do not create nor destroy charge. Okay? You don't create or destroy energy either. You just change it from electrical energy to light energy, to heat energy, to motion energy, to whatever energy it is. Okay. Now, those are the circuit elements. Now let's look at what's happening. The flow of electrons. 
Now the flow of electrons, the elect okay. Let's call them charges, charge carriers. Yes, they really are electrons, but later we're going to talk about them going in the opposite direction. So it's charge carriers. The unit for charge is Coulomb. But just like in so many things in physics, we've already hit these. When we first talked about measuring a distance, what's the next thing we did? Take the time rate of change of that distance, and we talked about speed or velocity. Then we took the time rate of change of velocity and got an acceleration. I don't know if you remember this. We took the time rate of change of momentum and got a force. You always attack. You take the time rate of change of energy, you get power. You're always taking time rate of change of something. When you take the time rate of change of charge, charge per unit time, coulombs per second, this produces an amp. Okay, now written the other way, charge, the symbol for charge is Q, the parameter. The unit charge per time is current. Why capital I? I don't know, but that's what they use. So that's what they are talking about at the bottom of page 462 and top of the next page, the current. One ampere is one coulomb per second, and that's what this is. One amp one coulomb in one second. The rate at which the charges are moving, that's your current. And this can be direct current going in one direction or alternating current going back and forth and back and forth. Uh, so really what we're more interested in is the field, but we still measure it in current. Okay? Now, on page 463, the figure you see they didn't include here, they show the, now they call it negative current, this is the electron current flows in one direction, the positive current, which we call current, okay, uh, the conventional current flows in the other direction, and that's what analogous to here, but in that figure they're calling this the negative current, and they call this the positive current. I don't know why they would use them first. Okay? Now, Voltage. That's what the battery is producing. And what is a volt again? It's been a long time. <laughs> Say again? Is it one joule per one? Yeah, is that coulomb? coulomb, yeah, joule per coulomb. Energy per unit charge. That's what a volt is. So that's your energy, okay? It's potential difference, and the, our book. Your book on page 463 calls it, I don't know if they say potential difference, I'm going to say potential difference, is uh, they call it work per unit charge. But work and energy is the same units, joules per coulomb, okay? Uh, it's energy if it's expending, it's work if it's doing, it, you know, that kind of thing. Okay? That is your voltage. And that is one volt. Let me write that down. One volt is one uh, joule per one coulomb. All named after people. Okay? That's how they write it. One joule per coulomb. Now, Remember that poor conductor they were talking about where there's a lot of interference to keep the charges from moving? That's usually in your load, okay? And the thing that's in there, uh, now, we have several different light bulbs these days. Back 20 to 30 years ago, well, the screw-in light bulbs, we only had one kind. It's called an incandescent light bulb. Oh, what does incandescent mean? Anyone know? Basically, it's giving off light. It's glowing, okay? An incandescent worm glows, okay? Just us, okay? So that's what it means. Now, why did it glow? Because it got very hot. I bet you, if you've ever tried to remove a light bulb that's been on for a long time, 
You don't do it. You turn it off, let it cool down, then you remove it, right? Because you'll come close to burning your fingers, okay, by touching that really hot bulb, okay? Because it's producing a lot of heat. And what you're doing, you're producing heat because the current, the electrons that are trying to flow through that bulb are meeting a lot of resistance. And when you meet a lot of resistance, it's just like rubbing your hands together while you're pressing them together. They get hot because there's a lot of resistance between the, uh, the prints on your palm, you know, and the crevices and stuff. That's what's creating heat. And the, that filament then, when it gets really hot, it glows. And typically that's a titanium filament, which is a port. Well, it's a metal, so it's a decent conductor, but it's a lot worse conductor. You never get any light out of a copper filament. <laughs> I mean, it just conducts the electricity without any resistance or without much resistance. Okay, so uh, that's the load. Usually, it's using the energy. Okay, uh, so that uh, opposition to current flow is called resistance. Now. There are four big features that goes into resistance. The first item I just mentioned, the type of material. Now this is not the same order that your book is given, but it seems like it makes sense to do it this way. The type of material. I just mentioned that filament is not made out of copper, it's made out of, the old ones are made out of tungsten. They may have a new material now, but it was tungsten. It had not nearly as good a conductor as copper, so it heated up. When it heated up, it glowed a nice white light. Okay? Now, there's another feature of the resistor that increases resistance, and that's the length of the resistance. I'll use this analogy. I don't know if you've ever noticed this before. If you have a uh, hose and you're watering something in the yard, you have a you know, on your stick it back at the house, a long hose and you're watering, and you want to go further down and connect another hose to it and go further down, and then maybe another one and go even further. After a while, what you notice about the flow of water? It doesn't have nearly the energy it did with just one hose on. Or when you just turn on the spigot. Why? Because all along the hose, the walls of the hose, there's resistance to the flow of water. So that resistance is diminishing the energy of the water, okay, all along the way. Well, the same thing with uh, your wire, let's say the tungsten wire. Now, have you ever, I mean, I know people don't have as many incandescent bulbs anymore, but you've seen one sometime in the past. What did you notice about the filament in there? Did you ever notice that it sometimes... A coil? Take a look. It looks all, almost like a little spring in there. If you got one of those bulbs that's clear. Have you seen that? Okay, think about that. To get from this pole to that pole, and you have it coiled like that, just think if you stretch that how, out, how long that would be. More resistance. Okay? Another feature of that poor conductor, besides its material, tungsten, the length of it, because it was coiled like that, is how big it is. Okay, think of this. What if, okay, have you ever been to one of your fast food places in the morning, driving in, you really need some caffeine to get awake this morning, so you buy that hot cup of coffee, and you get one of those little bitty stirrers that you can sip through, and, you know, if you did that with your coffee, yeah, burn your mouth like crazy. So you sit through it. Well, actually what you're doing is little bitty stirs conduct the heat out, you know, and, and you just don't get as much, so it doesn't burn you as badly, right? But have you ever tried to take one of those little stirs and drink a milkshake with it? No, you wouldn't. If you did, you'd probably pop your eardrum and you couldn't get anything out. I want that milkshake, okay. But the, uh, you would use a, 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 a straw more like that, right? To drink the milkshake, okay? And the reason is, the bigger the diameter, the easier it is for the flow to go through. 
See, milkshakes are a lot more viscous, a lot more resistant than hot coffee is. So you can drink hot coffee through one of those little bitty things, but you can't drink a milkshake through it. Well, same thing with electricity. You have a little bitty thin wire, it's more resistance to the flow of electricity than a great big heavy wire. And sure enough, those light bulbs, what is the thickness of that wire? If you had some, uh, it's about the thickness of a hair. And it's coiled like that. So you have a very small diameter which increases resistance like crazy. Okay? And then the other thing that does is temperature. Because remember, when something heats up, the molecules move more rapidly, like rubbing your hands together. Rub your hands together like that. You don't produce a lot of heat, do you? Rub them like this, and you produce a lot more heat, right? So temperature is the speed at which the molecules are moving, right? Average kinetic energy. Well, guess what? The faster they're moving, the more they bounce off each other, and the more resistance it is. Okay? Now, this may sound like an off-the-wall question, but back when you had incandescent light bulbs, when did they most frequently blow out? When do you remember most light bulbs? When did they usually blow out? You know what I want? When you first turn them on. That's exactly right. And here's the reason for that. When you first turn them on, that filament is cool. So when you first turn it on, suddenly you get a lot of current through there because, relatively speaking, because it's not hot. So the last time you turned it off, it was hot. It had been on a while, right? And so not very much. And as it was hot, actually what it was doing was losing some of its thickness, you know, because it was uh, basically popping off atoms or things like that. So you were losing some. And, but it wasn't carrying that much current because there was a huge amount of resistance because of all the heat. But then, that same very thin wire, you turn it on, very cool, it's going to try to carry a lot of current. And it's too thin now, it blows. And that's why, because it had less resistance when it was cool than it did when it was hot. And as soon as it has less resistance, more current, blow the bulb. And that's exactly what happened. So the material, the cross-sectional area, the length, and the temperature all contribute. And the uh, material itself, every material has a certain resistivity. And uh, you relate that, uh, and tungsten has a lot more resistivity than uh, copper, okay, and many other things, too. Okay. Here's another sort of sad story, but it's true. Uh, copper is not the best re uh, conductor. It's one of the best. In fact, most accounts, it's like second best. And it's really close to the best one, but not quite as good. The best one is silver. So why don't we use silver in the wiring? Because that would be even less resistance to copper. Anyone think of any reasons? Way too expensive, okay? Yeah, absolutely. Who wants to wire a house out of silver? I'll go with the, uh, you know, light in the fireplace, you know, and keep the money from the silver. No. But the other thing is copper is very ductile. It bends easily and stuff. Silver does it. It's pretty brittle. And, yeah, there may be a few other reasons, but those are the major. Now, the next best usually in the tables are gold. Same problem with silver, and it's not as good as copper, but it's still a pretty good conductor. And after gold, I think usually comes aluminum. Pretty good conductor, but not as good as copper. It's fairly ductile, so it will work. Now, back in World War II, uh, if you think about it, I don't know how much you are on political science and war science and things like this, World War II was different from all the preceding wars, as every war has been. Uh, but in the fact, the Germans actually came out with it first, Blitz, Blitzkrieg, or however you say that. 
They just threw all kinds of artillery and airstrikes and everything at the enemy, just hitting them, hitting them hard, basically destroying their uh, defenses, destroying everything, destroying morale, and just rolled over them with their tanks and other things like that. They just ran through Europe that way. Well, when we had to start defending against that, we had to throw artillery and bombs and all sorts of things back at them, way more than they used in the earlier war, like World War I, in fact. Mostly then it was just firing guns at each other. They had some artillery and stuff, but yeah, but nothing like World War II. So when we're fighting two major fronts, Europe, the Germans and Italians, the Allies there, the Axis forces there, and then over in the Pacific, Japanese, we were huge demand for brass. Does anyone know why brass was used in munitions? It's actually the shell casings. And why would they use brass? Brass is typically non-magnetic, so it's not going to draw the tendency for unwanted charge, like arcing and sparking. And you really don't want your munitions to arc and spark, do you? No, you can have things blowing up spontaneously. You don't want that. So they use brass. But brass is an alloy. It's not an element. It's an alloy of copper. And I never remember what the other one was. I think it's zinc. Okay? Uh, bronze and, and brass, I always get confused. But one of them is copper and zinc, and one of them is copper and something else. I believe brass is copper and zinc. Okay? So that's a special alloy, it's non-magnetic, you know, it makes great shells. So in World War II, suddenly all the copper that they could get their hands on was going to making munitions, making the shell casings for bullets, for projectiles, bombs, for everything. They were using brass all over the place, so there went all the copper. So in World War II, when new houses were being built, and there weren't that many, but when they were, there wasn't enough copper for a electrical wiring. It all went to the war effort. So they reduced the standards and said, okay, you can use aluminum. And many of the wartime houses were built with aluminum. But of course, back then, you know, in the 1940s and so, about all they used the electricity for was lights. In fact, my grandmother, to as, as far as I know, to her dying day, she never called it the electric bill or the power bill. She called it the light bill, because that's what she first started using, had her house wired for electricity, so she could have incandescent lights. She didn't, you know, she still ran everything else the way she always had, heated it with a wood stove and, you know, or, or propane or something else, but she didn't use it, anything but lights, okay. And that's how it was basically around World War II time, but then after the war, the baby boom and all this kind of stuff, then we started wanting all kinds of things run off electricity, washing machines, dryers, heat, you know, cook stoves, you know, everything was running off, air conditioning. Well, when that good old aluminum was now having to be produced, a lot more charge flowing through it, it had higher resistivity than copper did. Guess what it did? Yeah. It heated up. So why don't you find many houses with cop uh, aluminum wiring anymore? They all burn down, okay? Because the aluminum wiring caught fire, the insulation fire, the whatever, they either got retrofitted to copper or they burned down one or the other because they could not carry that load. So the resistivity is important. Copper being our best resistor that we usually use and aluminum not nearly as good. And then the list gets way more poor after that. One other you might need to be familiar with. Have you ever heard of the term nichron? Nichrome? You have? Yeah, okay. It's a nickel chromium alloy. Again, a mixture of two. And I bet you every one of you used this before. Ever used the eye on a stove? Yes. Electric stove? That thing that runs around in your oven, you know, the thing that when you turn on the thing, it gets red, hot, 
that's nichron because it's a really lousy conductor okay has a lot of resistance and that's what you see it heats up because of the resistance in there uh really lousy conductor but there's a reason for it most of your space heaters that you see glow nichron okay let me see where i am now uh, i hope i don't get off on tangents too quickly here okay so here is the equation that relates those things we just talked about now I'm going to clear off my writing here because I need to write some other stuff. But I need to find the key. There it is. Okay. I've been talking about resistance. Okay. That's that characteristic that resists the flow of charges. Okay. That's what your load somehow is, is using. Okay, your resistivity, that characteristic of the material, that's given the symbol rho. <laughs> okay, that's the, the Greek letter R. So resistivity is rho. Your length, the greater the length, the greater the resistance, right? But the smaller the cross-sectional area, the greater the resistance. So that's an inverse relationship. So the higher the resistivity, the more resistance. The longer the length, the greater resistance. And the smaller the cross-sectional area, the greater the resistance. So this formula shows you the relationship. This produces the resistance of the material, whether it's the filament in the light bulb, the nichron in your stovetop, whatever it is. Okay? So example one comes from that. Find the resistance of a copper wire, which is 20 meters long, 20.0 meters long. Which one of those symbols would that be? That's your L, the length. Exactly. Okay. With a cross-sectional area of 6.56 times 10 to the minus 3 square centimeters. 6.56. 5, 6 times 10 to the minus 3 square centimeters. Okay, now, just to get an idea of what we're talking about here, a centimeter is about the width of your little fingernail, okay? And a thousandth of that would be if you slice your little fingernail into a thousand equal pieces. Don't do it, you know. But if you did, that would be a thousandth of a uh, centimeter. And then you take that and multiply it by itself. You know, six, you know, like three times two or something like that. That's a really small cross-sectional area, okay? Uh, at 20 degrees Celsius. And that comes into play. Well, it doesn't say so here. But what is 20 degrees Celsius approximately? Did we talk about that before? We didn't. Okay. Yeah, that's right. We haven't done any temperature. That was my other class. Okay. That's room temperature. 20 degrees Celsius is 68 Fahrenheit. So this room, I bet you we're not much over 70 or 71, 72. So we're just over 20 degrees Celsius. Okay. So that's why they put that in there at room temperature at 20 degrees Celsius. It's not part of the equation here. It's just telling you. The resistivity of copper, that would be rho. Oh, and this is cross-sectional area. Uh, rho, resistivity of copper, no matter what size, shape, or anything else of copper, at 20 degrees Celsius, so at the same temperature, room temperature, is 1.72 times 10 to the minus 6 ohm centimeter okay now sorry about this it's the next section that they talk about what an ohm is if I'm not mistaken 
because I sure don't see that here that they bring it up here. Uh, so let's talk about <laughs> what that is. Resistance is measured in ohms. The reason for that, there was a German scientist, Georg Ohm, O-H-M, who did some of the early, early work in studying resistance. The very current and voltage, and notice they related to each other in a direct sense. You increase the voltage, you increase the current. You decrease voltage, decrease current. You increase current, you increase voltage. Yeah. He saw this relationship. Well, that was a direct relationship, so it had to have a constant of proportionality. And that constant of proportionality was the resistance. Okay? And which meant that if you increase resistance uh, at the same voltage, you're going to decrease your current. It had more resistance. So it turned out being not just a constant of, but it actually turned out an important characteristic. So since he discovered and talked and worked with it, they named the unit after him. His name was Gaylord Ohm. Gaylord Ohm. Uh, you spell his last name O H M. So if they're naming the unit after him, Ohm, what symbol do you think they wanted to use for that unit? Named after a person. Volta was volt. That was a V. Oh, okay. Yeah, O. Oh. Okay, so give me a number of ohms. Make up a number. 50, okay. So let's say 50 ohms. What's wrong with that picture? The zero and the O look almost identical, right? So maybe O would not be a good thing to use, okay? So they said, what can we use to represent this? Well, let's go to the Greek alphabet. Well, then the Greek alphabet, the letter corresponding to our O is Omicron, which is an O also, except for the Greek alphabet actually have two letters that start with O. Any idea what the second one is? Huh? Omega, you're absolutely right. And the symbol for Greek, Omega, now they have a capital and a lowercase. The lowercase is this, and we use that in physics too. The uppercase is that. So that's why we use that to represent Ohm. Because it's a capital Omega in the Greek alphabet. It's not the O, Omicron, but it's the capital Omega. Now, many of you probably have heard the expression, the first and the last, right? Something to do with that. And I bet you you heard another expression that's related to that, the alpha and the omega. You've heard that. And guess why they call that that? Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet, and omega happens to be the last letter in the Greek alphabet the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, okay? I think I know where y'all hear that from, but that's good. All right, um, so that's why we use capital omega. Now, this is completely off subject, but it just shows how weird physicists are, okay? There is a kind of a corresponding quantity. Omega measures the resistance of flow of charges. Whereas there's another characteristic that we sometimes like to use, which is conductance. How easily do the charges flow? And what conductance is, is one over resistance. It's reciprocal. So something with a high resistance is going to have a low conductance. Something with a low resistance is going to have a high conductance. It's reciprocal, right? So it's one over. So conductance... is 1 over resistance. Okay, now we measure resistance in an ohm. What are we going to measure conductance in? I don't know the person who did that. I don't know if any one person did it. So what could they use to measure conductance? Anyone have any idea what unit they use for conductance? I'll tell you so it won't take too much time. They use the Mo. 
Now, does that mean that Larry and Curly's friend was the one who developed this? No, it's not that mo. Okay, y'all don't even know what I'm talking about, do you? Okay, you do, right? Okay, good. I uh, hope somebody did. Okay, that's not where it comes from. Where did they get this unit mo? Any ideas? Any ideas? This is how weird physicists are. Where did they get the unit mo? It's one over resistance, conductance is. So what did they do? They spelled, they spelled on backward. That's exactly where they got the unit mo. They spelled on backwards. Okay? So what symbol are they going to use for mo's? You can't use M. They use that for meters. MH wouldn't seem like it made sense. What symbol would they use for conduct? Yes, I think I see you drawing it. That's exactly what they did. They flipped over an omega. That's not a letter in anybody's alphabet. They just inverted the omega because it's reciprocal. Conductance is reciprocal. Physicists are really strange beings. Okay. So that has nothing to do with this course, but I thought you might find it interesting. Okay, so let's get this out of the picture here. The only reason I brought that up was the fact they were using ohm here, and they hadn't told you what an ohm was. That's a unit of resistance named after Gaylord Ohm, and the reason they use that symbol is you couldn't use a capital O because you would confuse it with... Uh, the letter O. And by the way, I usually say, why do they use a capital letter to represent a quantity? And quite often that's because it's named after somebody. One exception to that would be a leader. A leader, they use two symbols for. Most often it's capital L. It's not named after Fred Leader. He didn't come up with that. Okay. Why do you reckon they use capital L for leader? Say again? Well, link might be one thing, but the other is, just like you said before, what if you had 20 liters? Oh, oh yeah, it looks like a one. So you don't use a low, lowercase l, you use a cap, capital L. Now, some books and some things will use a script L, too, for liters, which is okay. You don't confuse that with a, a one, but quite often you'll see capital L which is neither here nor there either, but just to let you know there are some exceptions. Okay, so let's go on and calculate the resistance here. Let me get my pen back. Okay. The, oh, we first got to deal with something. Okay. Units. Notice we have a problem with units. The length was measured in meters? Are you kidding me? 20 meter length? That's probably 25 yards. Okay? That's a long, long piece of material. Okay? But here you're talking about a cross-sectional area of six thousandths of a square centimeter. 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 And here your resistivity is on centimeters, not on meters. So what do you notice here? Your length units are not matching. So either you got to get these into meters, so you got two of them and that one squared, or you need to get that one into centimeters, which you reckon is going to be easier to do. I think so too. So the trouble is, which way do you go with that? How do you get your 20.0 meters to become so many centimeters. You don't have to use this, but it's one way to do it. You could just move a decimal, but you know which way to move it. So that's why I like to use this. When you're doing a conversion, you always put what in its place? The units. So what unit goes where? This line is for numbers, that's for units. Always put the units in their place. Which unit goes where? Centimeters on top, 
and meters on the bottom, and then you ask yourself how many centimeters in a meter or how many meters in a centimeter. Now you put the numbers in. Do you know? Second? 100 centimeters makes one meter. Think of this. A hundred centi dollars makes a dollar, right? You all know that, right? Wait a minute. What is a centi dollar? I do. I think I do. Let me see. I believe I have a centi dollar. We sort of abbreviate the name. What do we call that? What else do we call it? What's its value? One cent. cent. That stands for centi dollar. A hundred of a dollar. Okay. Okay. So it's a hundred cents in a dollar, a hundred centimeters in a meter. Okay. See, y'all knew that, didn't you? Okay. How many soldiers does the centurion have under his command? About a hundred. Very good. Okay. How many years in a century? A hundred. Y'all knew that, didn't you? Okay. All right. Good deal. All right. So this will be 20 times 100, which will be 2,000, right? Oh, so I got too many. 2,000 centimeters, okay? Move the decimal two, two places to the left. I mean to the right. Why? Because you're going from a big unit to a small unit, so you have to go from a small number to a big number. So you make it bigger by two zeros because there's two zeros there. So, now we can do it. Your row is 1.72 times 10 to the minus 6 ohm meters, strange unit, times your length is 2,000 centimeters divided by an area of 6.56 times 10 to the minus 3 square centimeters, okay? Everything's at 20 degrees, so we're okay. That's your temperature variation. If you had the temperature in this equation, you would have to change your area, you'd have to change your row because all those change at different temperatures, okay? So we're fixing it at one temperature. Now, how you do, well, if you got a scientific calculator or any kind of calculator, you can just plug them in, remembering that you're scientific notation, look for the EE or EXP key, right? And do 1.72 EE or EXP, and you'll get a little two digits up there. And if you got a calculator with a, plus, with a minus sign in parentheses, that's your negation key. Don't use your subtraction key. That'll give you a wrong answer. The negation key is in parentheses. It's a minus in parentheses. Six times 2,000 divided by 6.56 EE or EXP negative 3. And that's the negation key. See what you get. Oh, let's look at the units. This centimeter here wipes out one of those centimeters. I put the wrong units down. That was ohm centimeters. And then this centimeter will wipe out that centimeter, and that will give you your resistance in ohms. Very good. So we got our unit. What is our number? Has anyone done it yet? I'll help out a little bit. Okay? This 10 to the minus 3 could go into that 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 3 times, because you subtract your exponents. Okay? And then 10 to the minus 3 times 10, if you move that decimal three places here, that wipes out that one. So if you want to not have to use scientific notation, it's 1.72 times 2 divided by 6.56. That should give you the same answer. Do that one and see what you get. 0 0.524 ohms. Very good. That's a lot easier than using all that scientific notation, isn't it? Okay. All right. That was example one. And that's our only example in that section. You do have 10 problems. I think the odds have the answers in the book, so do any of the odds one through nine. Now let's move to Ohm's Law. And I'm sorry we don't have a slide on this one too, so I'll do it on this one like I did before.
erase all this. And here's Omla. Again, done by Georg Simon, I guess is how you say it, Ohm. No, or Simon, I guess it is. Georg Simon Ohm. Came up with Ohm's Law. Um, he was, by the way, he was a physicist born in Bavaria, which is around Munich. Uh, Ohm's Law resulted from his work in research in electricity. The unit for measuring resistance, Ohm, is named after him. You already knew that. Okay. Now, a lot of materials are what they call ohmic, which means the relationship between current and voltage is linear. Increase the voltage, you increase the current in a linear fashion. There are some materials that do not do this, like semiconductor diodes and things like this. They are non-ohmic, so you can't use Ohm's Law there. This only works for ohmic materials, but most materials, normal, common materials are. And here is, whoa, how did I get there? Okay, less, there are three ways you can express Ohm's Law. The one they give in the book is the current is equal to the voltage over the resistance. Okay, and again you could say that the, and they take this from the figure they have, the slope of that line is 1 over R, okay, so, current and voltage are directly related. Increase voltage, you increase current, vice versa. But inversely related to resistance, so therefore it's 1 over resistance. So this is one way of expressing. Can anyone tell me two other ways to express Ohm's Law? Using those three symbols and the equal sign. Two other ways to express that. Second, R is equal to what? V over I. I can see your mouth forming. And what's the third one? Okay, I is equal to V over R. We got that one. R is equal to V over I. The one other. V is equal to IR. That's it. So you have the multiplicative and two divisions, okay? Now, did I tell you about the circles and the triangles before and how a lot of formulas you can help remember that way? Okay, let me just show you. Because this is actually the first one that I ever saw illustrated this way. You can either use a triangle, okay, or you can use a circle. It doesn't really matter. You, do, you use them the same way. I prefer triangles, but some people prefer circles. This is the horizontal line is a division line, you know, like you're dividing, okay? And the other, the vertical line is your multiplication line. So if you can figure out which one goes where, like V is equal to I times R, now you've got all three of them there. And you do the same thing with the circle, V is equal to I times R. If you're looking for any one of them, cover it up. I is equal to V over R. R is equal to V over I, and V is equal to I times R. So if you can just remember which one to put where, so remember one of them, you got all three of them, right? So it works for tons of things, especially in electricity, you have a lot of relationships. You can do the same thing. Uh, distance is equal to speed times time, right? And then speed would be distance over time, and time would be... Yeah, yeah. So you can you can do lots of things with the same characteristic there. Okay? So that's Ohm's law. Where I is the current. And rem remember what current is? The time rate of change of charge. So this would be in amps, and an amp is a coulomb per second. That's current. Resistance is in ohm. Okay. And voltage is, uh, remember voltage? It's been a long time, but remember what it is? Joule per coulomb. Okay, joule per coulomb. Energy per charge. Okay. Now, in some of the older books and other places you might run into this, you'll see it written this way. Uh, I is equal to E over R. 
Now, there's two reasons they don't use that much anymore. Where the E came from was they, what they called EMF, and that stood for electromotive force. But guess what? Voltage is not a force. It is electromotive, but it's not a force. So they got away from that. The other reason is E is often used as a parameter for energy, and you would get that confused. So that's why they don't use that anymore. But occasionally you'll see that. The EMF are the voltage of the material. But generally, I'm going to try to avoid that. There's one place I will at least mention it again, and it's because it helps me remember a formula, but that's okay. So anyway, we've got the three forms here. I is equal to V over R, R is equal to V over I. And uh, by the way, that sort of defines for you what the units for an ohm is. It's a volt per amp. Okay. Now, here's another thing that I want to do a timeout. Okay. We have parameters and we have units. And why we use so many symbols for so many different things, I don't know, but we do. So I is the parameter for current. The unit is amps. R is the parameter for resistance. This unit is ohms. Okay? That would make it. Uh, you know, just about anything. Um, energy, the unit is joule. You know, power, the unit is watt. You know, the symbol is P, but the unit is W. Here's the weird one. Our unit for volts is volt, and our thing for EMF, electromotive force, is voltage. Okay? We use the same parameter as we do the unit. It's the only place I know in physics we do that. The parameter is V, capital V, and the uh, unit is capital V, measuring that same thing. Okay? Rather weird, but true. Okay? So don't let that throw you. Now, there's a nice little blurb there on the string of lights. It says, try this activity. If you have something that you can do that with at home, if we had a lab, we'd do a really fun lab with that, but we don't have time or opportunity to do a lab, so we're not going to do that. So let's do example one. Ready for it? Oh, I've got to find my key. Okay, example one. A heating element on an electric range operating at 240 volts. What's that a measure of? It's a real easy one. Voltage, potential difference. That's the one that uses the same parameter as you do unit. Okay, just talked about it has a resistance of, resistance is R, the symbol for the parameter is R, it has a, a uh, resistance of 30.0, what unit for that? Resistance? Ohm, okay. What current does it draw? So what are we looking for? Current, what's the symbol for that? Capital I. So this is what we're looking for. And what formula might you use to get current out of voltage and resistance? V over R, you got it. Okay, and what's your V? 240 volts, same unit as you have parameter, divided by 30.0 ohms. Okay? Now, here's how I'm going to simplify the division. Okay, the 30.0, that 0 is only there being a significant digit. But you can just divide both numerator and denominator by 10, which is wiping out the 0. 3 will go into 24 how many times? Pretty easy. 8 times. And because we have 3 significant digits, we'll put 8.00. And what unit for current? Second, ampere, 8.00 amps. Now, for some reason, oh, I think I know, this 240, I was assuming that was a significant di digit. Obviously, it's not because they only use two significant. So I made an assumption which was wrong. 
that that was significant. They didn't put it as significant, so therefore the answer is 8 ohms. Even though you had three significant digits in 30, you didn't have but 2 in 240. Okay? Now, any questions on that? Okay. Less, can I clear it? Okay. I hope that's okay. I just, you staring into space. Okay. <laughs> Example two. A light bulb is connected to two dry cells with an equivalent voltage of 3.0 volts. So that's going to be your voltage is 3.0 volts. Now they draw a little diagram here, and I'm going to mimic that diagram. And I swear that this kind of irritates me. Look at the picture there, and they show, show the eye going counterclockwise from low potential to high potential. And look at this one, and they show the uh, the eye going from high potential to low potential. Why don't they make up their minds? I don't know. Uh, it doesn't really matter, uh, but we'll do it. Okay. Flash bulb, flashlight bulb connect two dry cell batteries, voltage of uh, 3.0 volts. If it draws 15 milliamps, what's that a measure of? Current. And what's the symbol for current? Capital I. So that's 15 milliamps. And what does milli stand for? I'm going to write it down, 15 milliamps, because that's what they gave us. But milli means one thousandths of an amp. So that means you would move the decimal three places that way and make it 0 0.1, 0 0.015 amps. If you want to get to your base unit, that's what you do. You could do the conversion, which maybe I should, but I was wanting you to get used to just moving your decimal place. Three places, 10 to the minus 3, so move it 3 to the left. You're going from a small unit to a big unit, so you're going from a big number to a smaller number, so move it to the left. Okay? What is the resistance? So what are we looking for? Resistance in R. And how is R related to voltage and current? That's your Q? <laughs> v over R. I mean, V over I. Okay? And this would be 3.0 volts divided by 0 0.015 amps. Now, since you have all these decimals in there, I suggest you move this decimal three places to the right and that one three places to the right. And that gives you 15 divided into 3,000. Well, 15 will go into 30 two times, and then you got two more zeros. That would be 200 ohms. Okay. See how that works? And they go to the emphasizing that you only have two significant digits there because the 15 had two, 3.0 had two, so it's just 200 ohms, but the middle zero is significant, the last one is not. Not that that really matters that much, but that's what they do. Now, what I was going to do was draw the circuit for you, just so you can see this. The voltage is represented here. Because you have two batteries, I would put two cells there. Each of those cells is 1.5 volts. So this is the positive side, that's the negative side. You're going up here, and then you have the resistance here. There's your resistor. And then you're coming back around to the lower side. Now, conventional current, you would do your I this way. This is your resistor here, this is your voltage here. Uh, the cur conventional current that way, electron current that way. It doesn't really matter which one you do, but I wish they'd be consistent in the book. The voltage here was 3.0 volts, and the current here was 15 milliamps. 
which was also 0 0.015 amps. And that made your resistor equal to 200 ohms. And by the way, just for your thing, we're talking about e heating element in the electric range. That's quite a bit of resistance. 200 ohms is a lot of resistance. Well, of course you want it to be a lot of resistance. You want it to get hot. And that's why it's nichrome, which is a very low resistive, a very high resistivity, so it's going to get very hot. Very little current gets through there, but it takes a lot of voltage to get it across. And by the way, notice that's not your normal household voltage. Wait. I'm sorry, I'm doing the other problem. These are, this is the flashlight battery. I'm sorry, I was getting them crossed up. That's very low current. It doesn't get that hot. It's pretty high resistance. Sorry about that. Got crossed up and looking back at the problem. Okay, that finishes 17.6. There are 16 problems at the end. The odds have, I think, the answers in the back, so do any of the odds 1 through 15. That's what we got on Ohm's Law. Pretty simple, straightforward. That's Ohm's Law. All right, now we get to our next slide. We're talking about series circuits. Now, what we mean by series, okay, I'm going to erase my drawing that I did because that's going to get you confused here. That's the load sometimes written as a squiggly line. Okay. Um, and in this case, notice they have the current going in the other direction. I don't know why. Okay. But then when they drew the battery down below, they reversed the polarity of the battery. I don't know why they did that either. So mm -hmm. it's sort of a mystery to me. But here's what they said below. How you write, I'm going to write it the same way they did. Battery plus side minus side plus the long line. Okay. Resistance here. They draw a switch, and I'm not going to draw the switch because I don't like drawing switches, but you can have a switch drawn in if you wanted to. This is your resistance. This is your battery, which is your voltage source, the potential difference. Okay? This is your resistance here, and this is your voltage here. Okay? Your current is running in one direction or the other. I'll draw it conventional current. It doesn't really matter which one you do. Okay? Now, this is just a very simple circuit. What I'm going to do is put another resistor in here. I'm going to put it down here. So this will be R2. This will be R1. And maybe yet another one here. And this will be R3. Okay. These three resistors drawn this way are what we call in series with each other. And why do we call it in series with each other? I'm not really sure why, except that the same current has to flow through each one. There's only one circuit there, only one pathway. The energy is given to the charge in your battery, joules per coulomb, given to that. This uses some of it, that uses some of it, this uses some of it. By the time it gets back here, not a lot of energy left probably, okay? Because you have three resistors, okay? Now, this is called the series circuit. We really don't have that many series circuits anymore. Actually, we do have almost always your switch has to be in series with the load. Otherwise, it wouldn't switch anything. So the light switch is in series with all the lights in here. So when I flip the switch, they all go out. Or flip the switch, they all come on. But the light bulbs themselves are not in series with each other. And here's how I know that. And I'm just guessing here. I'm not going to do this. I might get in trouble. If I were to go up there and take out one of the tubes, the other light should stay on. If they're in series with each other, I take out one resistor, you don't have any. It's part of the circuit. And the current can't run if you remove that. Okay? So that's what it means to be in series. 
You take out one thing, the whole circuit shuts down. Just like if you take out the switch, the load goes off. Or open the switch, the load goes off. Close the switch, the load comes off. So that's what we mean by being in series. Now, this drawing I have here is somewhat similar. And let me just make sure they don't have it in the book. No, they don't. Okay. Somewhat similar to what they have in the book, only they drew it in one straight line. Okay. Um, and they drew a bigger battery, but it doesn't really matter. And the one in the book, they drew it with the current flowing from high potential to low potential. So fine. I, I mean, <laughs> well, in order to do this and make it look like theirs, I'm going to do another cell of the battery here. Okay. I can't get it to draw. There it goes. Okay. Just so it'll look like theirs. Uh, and it goes through all three resistors, one, two, and three. Now, they show this is I1 going through resistor 1. This is I2 going through resistor 2. And here is I3 going through resistor 3. Okay. There is a voltage drop across this resistor, V1, a voltage drop across this resistor, V2, and a voltage drop across this resistor, V3. Okay. Because every time it goes... Across the resistor, you drop the voltage a little bit. Okay. Now that's the setup they have here. I'm going to make it a lot simpler now. I think I've already said this. In a series resistor like this, the same current that leaves here goes through here, goes through there, and comes back here. Because why? You cannot create or destroy charge. The same charge is through it all, and if it's the same charge, all those I's are the same. So you could just call that I. And that's the first thing they list at the top, and they'll put it over here in the table. Your current in a series circuit, your total current is the same as your I1, your I2, your I3. It's the same current throughout the field. Your current does not change. You cannot change charge. Okay. Now, you, certainly your resistance could be different. And your voltage drop will be different because you've got the same current flowing through each one of those. If each one of those is a different size resistor, then you have a different voltage drop there because V is equal to I over R. I is the same. R changes, so your voltage drop will be different. You can't tell me. Oh, how sad. Okay. <laughs> We're running out of time. And what that leads to is your total resistance is the resistor of 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. So in a series circuit, your equivalent resistance, you just add the resistors together. And that makes sense. You add so much resistance here, so much here, so much here. Same current has to go through. Yeah. And your voltage across the battery is your voltage drop across the first one, the second one, the third one, and so on. So your current stays the same, your resistances add, and your voltages add. The voltage drops across each one. Okay? Those are the characteristics of your series circuit. Okay? Now, those three add up to... Oh, I forgot to get my... Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, to the three things on page 469, they're listed in three little green boxes. So we'll pick up next time with example one, I guess. Okay, yeah. I wish they had that kind of picture on the other. All right, good deal, folks. Um, we, believe it or not, are fairly close to ending. Uh, not as close as I thought. Uh, chapter 17. Okay. Goodness, this is a long chapter. We're not as close as I thought. Okay, good deal. Thanks. Okay. But we'll get there. Uh, hopefully finish it next time and move on to 18. Good deal. Any questions?